A few years ago, I attended a conference, and I was sitting in the audience just like you when a team of researchers rolled out a table with a giant screen attached to a computer. And they said, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like you to meet Larry. Larry was a therapist, a digital hologram therapist that could understand language and read facial expressions in real time. So one of the researchers pulled up a chair and sat facing Larry. She pretended to be a client and proceeded to tell a very sad story. And when she was done, Larry leaned forward, paused for a moment, and gently replied, so what I'm hearing you say is, no, 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 I remember looking around the room for other people's reactions. What were the researchers thinking? That some lines of code in a pixelated face could somehow fake human connection? But they defended their research by saying that millions of people around the world suffer from mental illness and that if artificial intelligence could somehow help alleviate the pain of depression and anxiety or just plain loneliness, why not? And if 24-hour online therapy bots could prevent a mass shooting or, or keep teens from being recruited by ISIS or the alt-right, why not? Intellectually, that made sense, but I couldn't shake a sinking feeling. Machines don't have empathy. Empathy is all the rage these days in design thinking, neuroscience, leadership, and business, you name it. It's also my life's work. That's why I'd like to share my definition with you. Empathy is the innate trait that unites us in our shared humanity. To me, empathy is about connection based on what we have in common. And through empathy, we transcend this thing called otherness without denying unique lived experience. Empathy evokes what it means to be human. So Descartes was close. I empathize, therefore I am. So you can appreciate why Larry really got under my skin. And I've had a complicated relationship with technology my entire life. In fact, my family and friends would tell you that I am the last person in the world that should be giving a talk about tech. I still use a paper agenda to keep track of my appointments. It took me seven years to join Facebook. And here's the kicker. Back in 1999, I didn't think email would become a thing. So when it comes to new technology, I get a little freaked out. Things like robotics and quantum computing, the Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, everything that falls under the umbrella of what is being called Industry 4.0. And I'm not the only skeptic out there. In fact, even technologists are getting concerned. Take Elon Musk, for example, the man who wants to colonize Mars. He believes we are summoning the demon with AI. Now that sounds scary. But a lot of people are really excited about the future. So let's take a deep dive into this brave new world. And let's start with virtual reality. In education, the applications are amazing, especially for student motivation. Imagine being able to take a virtual field trip through the inside of your human body for biology class, or teleporting to the Jurassic era to study history. And speaking of travel, imagine what virtual reality tourism is going to do for people who have limited mobility, either economic or physical. And in terms of healthcare, we can now step into exoskeleton suits and experience the physical effects of aging and hopefully make some wiser lifestyle decisions as a result. And that's just one example. And what about VR for to promote social inclusion and social justice. It is a powerful tool for storytelling. Some even call it the ultimate empathy machine. I remember when I first tried virtual reality headset. I put it on and I, was, I traveled to Rwanda, a country I've actually been to 10 years ago. And wherever I looked, left, right, down to the ground, up to the blue sky, I felt like I was really there again. And that's why journalists and filmmakers love the medium so much. It lets users step into other people's worlds. Worlds like refugee camps and disaster zones and even date rape scenarios. Three examples of pioneering VR films that were created to help build bridges of understanding. Now that sounds great, but it's not all roses. 
fact, critics call VR tragedy tourism. Mark Zuckerberg recently was slammed for a promo video that he shot on a virtual trip to Puerto Rico. Instead of focusing on the tragedy of the hurricane and its impact, he was ooing and aahing about his company's cool technology. Talk about being tone deaf. And what about addiction? A pioneering lab at Stanford University is creating VR apps for social good. But the director of this lab would be the first to tell you that addiction to VR pornography, fantasy worlds, and video games are going to be epic. And that's because VR is the most psychologically powerful medium ever invented. Very soon we'll be driving in virtual races in our cars and we'll be robbing virtual banks and we'll be having virtual sex. Real life is going to feel incredibly dull and boring by comparison. And all of that risk taking and cortisol and adrenaline rush, what is that going to do to our bodies? Our levels of stress, our relations to one another. Nobody really knows and that is a problem. Does this tug of war between pros and cons for new technology sound a little familiar? That's because we've been here before. When it comes to new technology, the diehards always love it and the naysayers always think it's the end of the world. Industry 4.0 will be no different. We can anticipate breakthrough innovations, innovations that will benefit humanity, and for sure there will be collateral damage, just like there was with the last tech revolution. Here's what I mean. When you think about smartphones and the internet, they were supposed to unleash unprecedented democratization and improve our lives, right? But did they? Well, the results are mixed. Sure, we have unlimited access to information and can communicate like never before, but our online privacy is gone. Okay, social media lets us stay in touch with our tribe, but now we have hostile actors that are exploiting echo chambers to drive us apart with very dire consequences, as we all know. And yes, smartphones do make our lives easier, but they also make us lonelier. It's sad, but true. We spend an average of four to five hours a day on our handheld devices using apps that have been reversed engineered to keep us hooked. And for children, Xboxes, smartphones, all that, they're like digital drugs. Regular use increases dopamine and decreases impulse control, just like cocaine. And tech addiction for older youth is getting just as serious. It's changing their brains, literally reconfiguring their neural networks. And it's correlated with increases anxiety, depression, and self-harm. In fact, in 2012, the same year that smartphone penetration reached 50%, teen suicide skyrocketed. And in terms of my own personal experience with millennials and Gen Zs, after a decade spent with them teaching in classrooms, here's what I've come to see. Every semester, we do a simple two-minute eye-gazing exercise where students sit in pairs facing one another, their hands on their lap, and there's no talking. And after those two minutes, we do a little debrief, and my students tell me they don't remember the last time they looked into someone else's eyes. Some tell me how special it was to really see a classmate and really feel like they were seen. And some even shed a few tears. They are craving human interaction and human connection. So this leads me to think, if this is happening with today's technology, what's going to happen with tomorrow's technology? Things like when artificial intelligence penetrates every aspect of our lives. AI will be everywhere. It will be in education, in healthcare, in banking, transportation, law. It will be in our kitchens and it'll be in your bedrooms. Soon we'll be having our annual checkup with an AI doctor. Imagine contesting a parking ticket before an AI judge. Or imagine having a little pillow talk with an AI chat bot after a long day at work, after you've driven home in your driverless car. All of this is just around the corner. 
And in terms of global implications, AI is expected to help fight climate change, help provide water and food security, and build sustainable cities. No wonder Stephen Hawking believed that achieving AI would be the single biggest event in all of human history. Unfortunately, he also added that it might also be the last unless we learn how to avoid the risks. Now, he's speaking about worst case scenarios like killer robots and digital dictatorship, but forget about doomsday scenarios. There are plenty of other reasons to be nervous. For starters, robots are expected to replace up to 800 million jobs by 2030. Jobs disproportionately held by people who already face social inequalities. How will society adjust to massive destabilizing unemployment? And what about when companion droids are part of our lives? Imagine your grandparents when they befriend their machine caregivers, or our children fall in love with their family bots. Already, US troops hold funerals for machines and robots that they've lost in combat. And what if sex with robots becomes popular or even the norm? Now, I know that sounds far-fetched today, but think about this. Sex dolls, which are not nearly as sophisticated as sex droids, are already all the rage in Japan, and brothels with sex dolls are popping up all over Europe. Up to two-thirds of men say they would have sex with an android, according to one report. And another survey says that a quarter of youth would happily date a robot. Soon, swiping left is going to seem fantastically old-fashioned. Now, I have no doubt that AI will achieve extraordinary things. And I mean that sincerely. But that does not negate the risks. And what I'm concerned about and most worried about is that new technology is going to erode our natural capacity to empathize. Already, empathy has plummeted by 40% among college students over the last 30 years. Despite this, many tech enthusiasts believe the answer is to humanize technology. And others believe that technology and machines augment our humanity. For example, one VR expert said, through this machine, we become more empathetic, and ultimately, we become more human. I really struggle with this line of thinking. Imagine clear-cutting a forest of majestic sequoias and using bonsais in a replanting effort. There's no comparison, no offense to the little bonsais. No matter how smart they get or how sophisticated their algorithms become, Machines will never truly emote, and the idea that machines will somehow make us more human is a sci-fi myth. We developed empathy a hundred million years ago to survive as a species, and we are born to empathize. In fact, we do nearly straight out of the womb. I remember taking my little daughter, Annika, out for a walk when she was three months old. We passed by another young boy in a stroller who was crying. And my daughter burst spontaneously into tears. Now, don't judge me, but as an empathy enthusiast, I was ecstatic to see that happen because that's called emotional contagion. And it doesn't just happen with kids. It continues well into our adulthood. I want to show you how it works. When you look at this image, you can't help but smile. And now when you look at this image, that smile will disappear. And that's thanks to our mirror neurons. And when we empathize, we produce oxytocin, a neurotransmitter that helps us connect and feel trust among one another, something that machines will never be able to do. But very soon, machines will be able to outperform us cognitively. They will be faster, they will be smarter, they will be more accurate than us. Which leads to a very interesting paradox that was packed neatly into a blog title that I came across recently. It read, why are we teaching humans how to code and machines how to learn? Jack Ma, founder of Alibaba, had a lot to say about education at this year's World Economic Forum. 
And obviously his comments struck a nerve because they've gone viral, over 30 million and counting. He said that what we are teaching in schools should be different from what machines learn because very, very soon AI will beat us at all knowledge-based cognitive tasks. Instead, what we should be focusing on in schools are things like creative and artistic expression, teamwork, independent thinking, and caring for others, because in those spaces, machines can't compete. Now, I want you to remember that schools were created to meet the needs of the Industrial Revolution, not Industry 4.0. That's why they're largely irrelevant and failing us today. Let's think about where we are in 2018. Extremism and populism are on the rise. Global inequalities are getting worse. Capitalist greed is destroying the planet that gives us life. We seek a sense of belonging and love through materialism and celebrity. And anxiety, depression, and addiction are all epidemic. I've asked myself, what is at the root of all of these problems? My conclusion is that we're suffering from a massive collective empathy deficit. And the only way out is through a revolution in how we relate to one another. Einstein believed that humans are delusional because we think we are separate from the whole. His solution was to widen the circle of compassion, to embrace all living creatures and all of nature in its beauty. And Charles Darwin, who famously coined the term survival of the fittest, also believed there would come a day when humans would extend empathy to all sentient beings. Isn't it interesting that two brilliant scientists are talking about global empathic consciousness, something spiritual leaders in the wisdom traditions have espoused for millennia? And they are all right. Global empathic consciousness is exactly what we need. We need it today to solve the urgent problems we are facing, and we need it for the future to survive and to thrive into tomorrow. Perhaps going forward, only the most empathic will survive, and empathy will save humanity. I believe, even in a world full of machines, that is our destiny. Thank you. <laughs>